This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. One more thing to look at with our leasing hat on is sell and lease back. Our notes cover both the perspective of the seller and the buyer, but the important one to, for us to understand is the books of the seller. So, in this situation, I own a football stadium. Perhaps the football stadium has a life of 40 years. I sell it and then rent it back for 40 years. Or I sell it and rent it back for five years. The first thing you have to consider is, was there a sale or is it simply a secured loan? So you'll notice there are two sets of rules when we consider sell and lease back. The first stage is to decide, was there actually a sale or not? If there wasn't a sale, which is the first scenario, what you've really got is a secured loan. If on the other hand, so in substance, this first one here, a secured loan. This is the case, I think, for example, when you sell an asset with a life of 40 years and then rent it back for 40 years. So you actually retain the risks and rewards of ownerships. It's not really a lease. It's simply a loan secured on that asset. So an example of this would be to sell PPE with a life of 40 years and to lease it back for the full term of 40 years. In that case, it's a secured loan. We'll look at some numbers so in that in a minute, I'll continue to recognize the PPE and I will have a great big financial liability in my books. I've borrowed some money secured on the stadium, but I retain control of the stadium for the whole of its life. Where it gets messy is if you determine that actually there was a sale. So an example of that would be to sell PPE with a life of 40 years and then you lease it back for 10 years. Then it is no longer your problem. The first one, life was 40, lease was 40. This time, life is 40, lease is 10. It's not my problem after 10 years. So I've sold it, or at least I've sold part of it. Because for the last 30 years of its life, it's someone else's problem. In that case, much easier when we look at the numbers in a moment. If you actually, in substance, have sold it, then the PPE will go out of the books. Goodbye. And instead of that, I will now have a leased asset, a right of use asset. Hello. Again, there's bound to be a lease liability. Lease liability, as with the rest of lease lessee accounting, you're looking at the present value of the lease payments. There's bound to be some adjustment as well, some gain or loss, and that gain or loss will go into p &L. I'll show you again, I'll show you that that's just a balancing figure in a minute. 
The bit that we will really need to get our heads around are the words highlighted in blue. This new leased asset, as it says there, it's a proportion of the previous carrying value of the underlying asset. Let me put C example, because that's the bit that you must be able to calculate. If you can calculate that, everything else is quite logical. So I'm going to focus on the perspective of the lessee, the person who sells it and then rents it back. Please pause the recording and spend a minute reading through, again, Apple, this example on sale and lease back. In terms of the data that we've got there, um, they haven't mentioned anything about the life of the original asset or anything. They've just said, well, supposing it is not a sale, supposing it is a sale, they've left it open so we can answer the question in both ways. So what happens if it's not a sale? And what happens if it is a sale? And that's the messy one. If it's not a sale, it will be a secured loan. And if it is a sale, we're going to have a lease coming into, into, into process. The data that we've got there effectively though, let's start off by saying that the carrying value is 8.4 million. And actually they are selling this asset for 10 million. They're selling it for 10 and its carrying value is 8.8, 8.4. That's all we need at first. So let's have a look and think about what would happen in example, this example here, example seven of the sale and lease back on the assumption that this is not a sale. If it's not a sale, in substance, it is a loan secured on the PPE. Therefore, you leave the PPE alone in the books. How do we say that? What's the posh way of saying that? Do not derecognize the PPE. but recognize a liability for the amount borrowed and the amount borrowed against this building was a massive 10 million. And then you'd use standard financial liability accounting to account for it over the term of the loan. What is more exciting though, is if it is a sale. You're probably saying it doesn't sound that exciting. It's a bit exciting. So we seem to have lost the, there it goes, we're back. So what happens if it is a sale? Several things happen. I will de-recognize the PPE at its carrying amount. I will recognize in its place a right of use asset. Now the way that we measure that right of use asset, this is the bit you need to learn, is that you take the carrying amount of the PPE or carrying value and you multiply it by the amount of the discounted lease payments so the present value of the lease payments over the fair value of the asset and if you imagine that the fair value of the asset was 10 and the present value of the lease payments was seven. 
it's kind of saying that you're leasing it back for seven tenths. So we should recognize that lease asset at seven tenths of the original carrying amount. But I'll show you that in just a minute. Also, I'll need to recognize a lease liability. And that's regular accounting. As with the rest of leasing, that will be the present value of the lease payments. I'll obviously need to recognize the cash. Can you see that we're heading towards a five limbed journals journal? If we count these up one, two, three, four. The final thing is there'll be an adjustment which goes in profit and loss. So the balancing figure will go to profit and loss. What does it represent? Well, it represents, it kind of represents, well, the profit that arises on the bit of the asset that you've actually sold on. And if conceptually we've kind of keeping seven tenths, it's the three tenths that we've sold on, but it's just a balancing figure to avoid problems. Now in this question, they've not actually given us the present value of the lease payment. So you could use uh, tables for that, but, or calculate it, but I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna add this on just to save us some time and say that if I round, on this that the present value of the lease payments if you want to add it onto yours is 7.7 .7 million let me just highlight that the present value of the lease payment is 7.7 .7 million so you can obviously check up on me in case I've made that number up. I haven't, but that's it. The lease payments are 10. Discounting, they've all got to be discounted for different times over 10 years. Take days, wouldn't it? So if you accept that number, we can now actually recognize this transaction. So if I now record the transaction, this is what's happening. Cash is going up debit cash, the cash proceeds again from this um, transaction are a massive 10 million, lovely. I'm also going to recognize a new right of use asset. That too is going to increase so as I said, you need to look at the carrying amount of the PPE. The carrying amount of the PPE was, it must be there somewhere, 8.4. Multiplied by the present value of the lease payments, which I just said was 7.7. .7. The fair value of the asset, the fair value of the asset was 10. So if I multiply that through 8.4 times 7.7 .7 over 10, I think that comes out at about 6.5. On the credit side, I'm de-recognizing the PPE. So PPE is going down by its carrying amount of 8.4. I'm recognizing the lease liability. That's at the present value of the minimum lease payments. And we said the present value of the minimum lease payments was 7.7. .7.
Obviously, it's not going to balance. There's bound to be a difference. So the balancing figure will go to profit and loss. It looks to me as if this is a book gain. 16.5 on the left. Minus 8.4, minus 7.7. 7. I think that would give you a profit of 0 0.4. If you're looking at the numbers in the back, again, they've done it in of the, our notes. They've done this in individual dollars, which you can do, obviously, if you want to. But for exam purposes, the best thing is to keep things as round as possible. The calculation can become more complex in practice if you don't sell the asset at fair value. But I wouldn't particularly, again, get excited about that because this exam is about explaining the basics. So any calculations, I think, would be at a basic level. And that is sale and lease back under IFRS 16.